Hello, I'm Osrin and we're in the community room where the Library for English Literature is kept and I've chosen one book from this collection. Many writers write sequels to famous novels and at the moment I'm enjoying reading Andrew Motion's Return to Treasure Island but Robert Louis Stevenson himself wrote a sequel to another of his famous novels, Kidnapped, and the sequel is Catriona. Catriona was written by him in his last years in exile in Samoa, remembering the Scotland of his youth. And it contains one of the chapters that is among my favorite in English literature. It's set again in 1751, not long after the Jacobite Rising, and Davy Balfour is once again the hero. The second half of the novel speaks of his, as a comedy of errors, his wooing as the straight-laced lowlander of the mercurial and titular Catriona the granddaughter of Rob Roy MacGregor. But the first half of the novel starts where Kidnapped left off with Davy in Edinburgh, anxious to secure the safe escape of his Jacobite friend, Alan Breck Stewart, and to deal with the aftermath of the notorious Appin murder, of which he was a witness and which he is suspected of being an accomplice. He courageously takes himself to the house of Lord Advocate Preston Grange to put before him his evidence. And the chapter that follows is that interview, at once a moral struggle and a sparkling fencing match that pitches politeness against undercurrents that are dangerous, exasperation and growing respect. Stevenson holds before us timeless antitheses of youth and age, of idealism and the responsibilities of office, of justice and the safety of nations, and running through it all, the ancient fissure that is the Highland line between the Gale and the Lowland Scot. I've chosen two short extracts from that conversation. The copy of the book that we have binds Kidnapped and Catriona together in one pocket-sized volume in the World Classic series published in the middle of the 20th century. Here is Davy listening to Lord Preston Grange in his house. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Balfour, he said when he had done. Let me offer you a glass of claret. Under your favour, my lord, I think it would scarce be fair on me, said I. I have come here, as the letter will have mentioned, on a business of some gravity to myself. And as I am little used with wine, I might be the sooner affected. You shall be the judge, said he, but if you will permit, I believe I will even have the bottle in myself. He touched a bell and a footman came, as at a signal, bringing wine and glasses. You are sure you will not join me? asked the advocate. Well. Here is to our better acquaintance. In what way can I serve you? I should perhaps begin by telling you, my lord, that I am here at your own pressing invitation, said I. You have the advantage of me somewhere, said he, for I profess I think I have never heard of you before this evening. Right, my lord, the name is indeed new to you said I, and yet you have been for some time extremely wishful to make my acquaintance, and have declared the same in public. 
I wish you would afford me a clue, said he. I am no Daniel. It will perhaps serve for such, said I, that if I was in a jesting humour, which is far from the case, I believe I might lay a claim on your lordship for two hundred pounds. In what sense? he inquired. In the sense of rewards offered for my person, said I. He thrust away his glass once and for all, and sat straight up in the chair where he had been previously lolling. What am I to understand? said he. A tall, strong lad of about eighteen, I quoted, speaks like a lowlander and has no beard. I recognise those words, said he, which if you have come here with any ill-judged intention of amusing yourself, are like to prove extremely prejudicial to your safety. My purpose in this, I replied, is just entirely as serious as life and death, and you have understood me perfectly. I am the boy who was speaking with Glenure when he was shot. I can only suppose, seeing you here, that you claim to be innocent, said he. The inference is clear, I said. I am a very loyal subject to King George, but if I had anything to reproach myself with, I would have had more discretion than to walk into your den. I am glad of that, said he. This horrid crime, Mr. Balfour, is of a die which cannot permit any clemency. The interview continues and there is some discussion of the role of the all-powerful Duke of Argyle, whose Campbell relative it is, that was the victim of the Appin murder. And then they get down to business. But to the interrogation, said Lord Prestongrange, and let me warn you to volunteer nothing beyond the questions I shall ask you. It may consist very immediately with your safety. I have a great discretion, it is true, but there are bounds to it. I shall try to follow your Lordship's advice, said I. He spread a sheet of paper on the table and wrote a heading. It appears you were present, by the way, in the wood of Lettermore at the moment of the fatal shot, he began. Was this by accident? By accident, said I. How came you in speech with Colin Campbell? he asked. I was inquiring my way of him to Alcarn, I replied. I observed he did not write this answer down. Hmm, true, said he, I had forgotten that. And do you know, Mr. Balfour, I would dwell, if I were you, as little as might be on your relations with these stewards. It might be found to complicate our business. I am not yet inclined to regard these matters as essential. I had thought, my lord, that all points of fact were equally material in such a case said I. You forget that we are now trying these stewards, he replied, with great significance. If we should ever come to be trying you, it will be very different, and I will press these very questions that I am now willing to glide upon. But to resume, I have it here in Mr. Mungo Campbell's precognition that you ran immediately up the brae, how came that? Not immediately, my lord, and the cause was my seeing of the murderer. You saw him then? As plain as I see your lordship, though not so near hand. You know him? I should know him again. In your pursuit, you were not so fortunate then as to overtake him. I was not. Was he alone? He was alone. There was no one else in that neighbourhood. Alan Breck Stewart was not far off. 
in a piece of a wood, the advocate laid his pen down. I think we are playing at cross purposes, said he, which you will find to prove a very ill amusement for yourself. I content myself with following your lordship's advice and answering what I am asked, said I. Be so wise as to bethink yourself in time, said he. I use you with the most anxious tenderness, which you scarce seem to appreciate, and which, unless you be more careful, may prove to be in vain. I do appreciate your tenderness, but conceive it to be mistaken, I replied with something of a falter, for I saw we were coming to grips at last. I am here to lay before you certain information by which I sh shall convince you Alan had no hand whatever in the killing of Glenure. The advocate appeared for a moment at a stick, sitting with pursed lips and blinking his eyes upon me like an angry cat. Mr. Balfour, he said at last, I tell you pointedly, you go an ill way for your own interests. My Lord, I said, I am as free of the charge of considering my own interests in this matter as your Lordship. As God judges me, I have but the one design, and that is to see justice executed and the innocent go free. If in pursuit of that I come to fall under your Lordship's displeasure, I must bear it as I may. At this he rose from his chair, lit a second candle, and for a while gazed upon me steadily. I was surprised to see a great change of gravity fallen upon his face, and I could almost have thought he was a little pale. You are either very simple or extremely the reverse, and I see that I must deal with you more confidentially, says he. This is a political case. Ah yes, Mr. Balfour, whether we like it or no, the case is political, and I tremble when I think what issues may depend 